everybody and welcome to our channel. If you've seen any of our past videos, you'll know that this one is a little bit different than what we normally do. Today, we are going to give you an introduction to the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. <laughs> Keep in mind, these really are the basics of the amendment, so don't think that everything we say here is absolute. This is just an introduction that we came up with using the Crash Course videos as well as our own research to get all of you started. If you want to fact check us or keep learning about this amendment, we've put some links in the description box below for you to check out. We should also let you know that this video right here is our final project for our government class. So we took our time making this and setting it up. And now with that all out of the way, let's get going with our topic today. The First Amendment. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. All right, well, that's great and all, but what does any of that even mean? Great question, Kayla. Basically, it means that the government is not allowed to restrict religion, speech, the press, or the citizens' rights to protest the government. Okay, uh, but one more thing. You mentioned the right to protest the government, but the video title uses the word liberties, so... What's the difference? Civil liberties, as defined by Crash Course, are limitations placed on the government. They are things the government can't do that might interfere with your personal freedom. This is why we use the word liberties in the title of this video. The First Amendment puts limitations on the government, not the citizens. Okay, that makes sense. But what about civil rights? Civil rights are more focused on the people. Crash Course says that they are curbs on the power of majorities to make decisions that would benefit some at the expense of others. Civil rights are guarantees of equal citizenship, and they mean that citizens are protected from discrimination by majorities. It's likely you've heard more about civil rights than civil liberties, and that's because civil rights do get talked about more often. However, they are both extremely important in conversations about the U.S. government. Now that we've gotten that all cleared up, let's take a look at each part of the First Amendment. The freedoms of religion, speech and the press, and the rights to petition and assemble. Are you ready? I think so. Then let's get started. <laughs> freedom of religion. The First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Basically, this means that the U.S. government can't do things like make a national church, write laws based on religious edicts, or create a nationwide religion for the country. This also means that they can't keep you from practicing any religion that you want. Unless, of course, that religion involves something like human sacrifice that's illegal. But they can't stop you from believing in human sacrifice. You can believe in whatever you want to in America. Hey, you know what I believe in? What? Myself. And that's her right. An example of someone using their right to the freedom of religion is in the 1962 case Angle versus Vital, in which it was decided that a school introducing prayer in a public school system violates the First Amendment. In this case, the New York school system started out every day with a non-denominational prayer acknowledging dependence upon God. This was challenged as a violation of the freedom of religion, and the Supreme Court agreed. As we've learned, the government is not allowed to advance any sort of religion to the people, and since school systems are an extension of the government, and these prayers were mandatory, they were deemed as not okay. So basically what you're saying is that schools initiating a prayer of any kind is unconstitutional? Yes, the government, including school systems, are not allowed to sponsor any sort of religious activity. Pretty straightforward. Sort of. There's more to it than that, but that's all we get into today. Let's move on to the freedom of speech. Okay, so the freedom of speech is defined by the Constitution as Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. The First Amendment protects you from the government punishing you for what you say most of the time. There are certain boundaries when it comes to what speech is and what speech isn't protected. The Crash Course episode on the freedom of speech gives a quote that 
I think sums up this idea well. They say, the First Amendment only protects you from government action, not the action of private people, especially your employers. What this means is that you can say whatever you wish to and about the government, but try to pull that on your boss and you'll probably get fired. The First Amendment can help you out there. But it's also important to mention here that just because you can say something doesn't mean you should. Words hurt. Think before you speak. Yeah, everybody has their own opinion, and it's important to respect each other. Just because we disagree doesn't mean we can't still be friends. Kill it with kindness! You mentioned that there are certain types of speech that are and aren't protected. What are those? <laughs> Better than those! <laughs> the types of speech that are protected, in a nutshell, are political speech, some symbolic speech, hate speech, spending money on political campaigns, and speech that encourages force or for people to violate the law. Basically, you're allowed to express any of your opinions, whether they be popular or not, without fear of government intervention. But what about the types of speech that aren't protected? The types of speech that aren't protected are commercial speech, plagiarism, speech likely to create violence, and fighting words. Wait, fighting words? Violence? I thought that you just said words encouraging force were okay. It is only okay when your words are unlikely to provoke action. If the force or violence you're advocating for is very likely to happen and soon, that's not okay. The First Amendment will not protect you. The logic behind why certain types of speech are and aren't protected would take way too long to explain in this video, and it's also very confusing. So for those reasons, we're gonna leave it at that. But feel free to use the links in our description to learn more about the different types of speech. Let's move on to the press. <laughs> okay, ready? Mm-hmm. Freedom of the press is very similar to the freedom of speech. The Constitution says that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the press. This means that the government cannot censor the press in any way. It can't prevent an article or post from being published or punish a news agency after the fact. Though there are a few exceptions, such as if the publication threatens national security or if an individual or agency sues for libel. A great example of the freedom of the press is the 1971 case, New York Times Company versus the United States. In New York, concrete jungle where dreams are made of. Wow, <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> In this case, the New York Times and the Washington Post were allowed to publish portions of the Pentagon Papers without risk of government censorship. History.com explains the situation perfectly. They say, the Pentagon Papers were a top secret Department of Defense study of U.S. political and military involvement in Vietnam from 1945 to 1967. Published portions of the Pentagon Papers revealed that the presidential administrations of Harry Truman, Dwight D. Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, and Lyndon B. Johnson had all misled the public about the degree of U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Did you get all that? Well, in case you didn't quite get all that, let's hear a quote from Crash Course that might clear it up a bit. They say, American democracy relies on its citizens having enough information to make good decisions and hold elected officials accountable. We rely on the press to tell us what the government is doing so that we can decide whether or not we want to let them keep doing it. Isn't that like that one act, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's the one where you can get like papers and stuff from the government? Yes, the Freedom of Information Act. This act is how many news agencies gain access to government papers, and it does relate here, but that's a whole other conversation. So yes, news agencies are allowed to publish government records, but if the records included classified information, say the exact location of troops during the war, no way would that get published. That is a definite threat to national security. That's a no. Like most things in government, this subject can get pretty complex, but remember the core concept. You are allowed to publish and post whatever you wish. But remember what we said earlier, words hurt. Be careful. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's move on to my segment now. Concrete jungle where dreams are made of. The rights to petition and assemble are expressed as two different parts of the First Amendment, but since they are very similar in definition and practice, we decided that for this video, it would work best if they were one segment. The First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law abridging the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. In less fancy terms, this means that, with the freedom of petition, citizens and interest groups have a way of bringing their issues to the government in an official way. And with the freedom of assembly, citizens can gather in protest as long as it's peaceful. Avengers Assemble! 
Hey, I have a question. Earlier, I wonderfully explained the difference between civil rights and civil liberties. You used the word right here, but it doesn't seem to have the same meaning. Yeah, so as you mentioned, we've already established the difference between civil rights and civil liberties. But civil rights are different from having a right. In this case, we're using dictionary.com's definition of right, which is a just claim or title, whether legal, prescriptive, or moral. So my right to protest the government would not be a civil right. That's right. But is it a civil right? I don't know. Or a just or claim title? It's not a civil right! I just meant that you were correct! Alright. Anyway, what these rights mean for citizens is that citizens are allowed to assemble and petition the government for a change through something like a peaceful protest or rally. They can also sue or lobby the government. However, citizens are not allowed to put other citizens in danger. If they do, the government is then authorized to get involved for the sake of safety. Citizens are also not allowed to hold gatherings without the required permits. Unless it's the permits that you're protesting, in which case... Uh, you know what, that's a whole other conversation. Okay, so we can protest the government for what we think needs to change as long as we are safe and have the correct papers to do so? In a nutshell, yeah. Do you happen to have an example of this? Well, yes, and I do. A great example is the 1962 case, Edwards vs. South Carolina. Here, 187 black high school and college students marched all the way from Zion Baptist Church to the South Carolina State House in protest of segregation. They walked for about 45 minutes and attracted a crowd of about 200 to 300 people. The police gave them all 15 minutes to disperse, and when they didn't, they were arrested and convicted for breaching the peace. This conviction was confirmed by the South Carolina Supreme Court, but was then overturned by the United States Supreme Court. Boom. It was clear to them that the protest was peaceful and the students never threatened violence or harm. In the words of Justice Potter Stewart, the First and Fourteenth Amendments don't permit a state to make criminal the peaceful expression of unpopular views. Hmm. Makes sense to me. With only one dissent, I think it makes sense to a lot of people. Alright everyone, that is all we have for you today. Hopefully you learned something about the First Amendment that you didn't know before. Remember, this video is seriously a crash course based mm -hmm. upon our research that we created as our final project for our government class. This video is not all-inclusive. We purposefully left some things out to keep it short, sweet, and beginner-friendly. If you want to expand your knowledge, we've left some links in the description box below that can point you in the right direction. Feel free to take a look. Thank you all very much for watching our video. Make sure to like, comment, and share with your friends and family. If you want to see more of our faces, feel free to hit subscribe and turn on notifications. Thank you once again for spending your time with us, and we hope to see you soon. Bye! Bye.